this is Cade. This is Emily. And this is Unit 4. Dun, dun, dun. Political geography is the study of human political organization at, of the Earth at various geographic levels. There are three levels. One, above country level. For example, geographers would look at the United Nations because it is composed of several countries. Two, at country level. For example, geographers would look at the workings of the U.S. government. And three, below country level. For example, geographers would look at voting district boundaries. Now for territoriality. It is human nature to want your own space. When we do this, it is called territoriality, or creating ownership over a defined space. The same principle that causes you to get angry whenever your sibling invades your room applies on a larger scale. For example, whenever Germany invaded Poland in 1939, Poland and other countries retaliated because people are protective of their own territory. Now moving on to states and nations. Areas of owned space often form states, which are political units with a permanent population, territorial boundaries that are recognized by other states, an effective government, a working economy, and sovereignty. We typically refer to these as countries. A state must have sovereignty, which is the internationally recognized control a state has over the people and land within its boundaries. A nation is a group of people that share a common culture and identity. For example, the Kurds are an ethnic Iranian group in the Middle East that share a culture and identity, regardless of the fact that they don't belong to a state. States and nations don't always go hand in hand. For example, the United States is a multinational state because they house many nations in their borders, such as the Mexican-American nation, the Jewish-American nation, and so on. The opposite of that would be a nation-state, or a state that houses only one nation within its borders. For example, Iceland only has one nation within its borders, so it is a nation-state. There is also such thing as a stateless nation, or a nation that does not have a specific territory. The Kurds that we talked about earlier would be a stateless nation because they do not belong to one state. This is Cade with <laughs> Nations in Conflict. Many people have what is known as ethnonationalism, or a powerful emotion or attachment to one's nation that is a minority within the state. When these same minorities nations feel like they don't have enough self-determination or power to control their own territory, it le usually leads to conflict. For example, the Chechens in the nation of Russia have a strong sense of ethno-nationalism and want more self-determination or power, so they have often fought with the Russian government. On the other hand, some nations are spread across many different states. For example, Hitler thought that the German nation had spilled into... Czechoslovakia. So he wanted to take control of... Czechoslovakia. To reunite the nation into one state. This was known as... Irredentism. <laughs> or a movement to reunite a nation's homeland whenever a part of it is spread into another state's borders. Sometimes to prevent conflict between two states, a buffer state or zone is put into place. A buffer state is an independent country located between two larger countries that are in conflict. For example, Russia and China have fought for years, but Mongolia, a buffer state, has helped to reduce conflict. A buffer zone is like a buffer state, but it consists of two or more states. Sometimes countries can dominate buffer zones through satellite states, which are countries that are controlled by a more powerful state. For example, during World War II, the Soviet Union dominated Poland and, and the buffer zone of Eastern Europe and made it into a satellite state to overcome the buffer zone. During World War II, Poland was also a shatterbelt, which was a state or a group of states that exists within a sphere of competition between larger states. So Poland was a shatterbelt between the larger warring countries of Russia and Germany. Now on to boundaries. In order to claim and define territory, people use political boundaries. There are several different types of political boundaries. Geometric political boundaries are straight line boundaries that do not relate to the physical or f cultural features of the territories involved. For example, the original boundary between North and South Korea followed a latitude line. Some countries use physical political boundaries, which are boundaries drawn according to physical features, such as mountains, deserts, or rivers. For example, France is divided from Spain by the Pyrenees Mountains. Another type of boundary is a cultural political boundary, which marks changes in the cultural landscape.
This could be a boundary drawn according to language or religion. For example, the borders of Pakistan were drawn to follow the Muslim religion. When borders are not clearly drawn, the area is called a frontier, or an area with unclear territoriality or ownership. Ocean boundaries are a special case. Because the ocean touches many countries, the rule is that coastal states can claim the sea up to 12 nautical miles from the shorelines. And coastal states can claim up to 200 nautical miles from the shorelines as an exclusive economic zone, or a zone where the state has the right to exploit natural resources in the water. When there isn't enough water between countries for the country to have 200 nautical miles, then the median line principle is used, and the water is divided evenly. Borders are sometimes classified by how they have changed over time, rather than how they were first drawn. Antecedent boundaries are boundaries that existed before human cultures developed into their current forms. These are usually physical barriers that existed before a political boundary was ever drawn. For example, Kentucky and Indiana grew as distinct cultures and districts before political boundaries were drawn because they are naturally separated by the Ohio River. The opposite of this would be a subsequent boundary, or a boundary that is drawn after significant settlement has already occur occurred. For example, the border between the Canada and the U.S. was drawn long after people had settled and grown into different cultures. So just remember that antecedent boundaries came before people, and subsequent boundaries came after people. Superimposed boundaries are forced onto a landscape by outsiders. For example, when Europeans came to Africa, they forced their own boundaries on land, regardless of the cultures and tribes that already existed. This one is easy to remember, because superimposed boundaries are imposed on people. Finally, there are relict boundaries, which are lines that used to be boundaries, but no longer are. For example, the Berlin Wall used to serve as a boundary between East and West Berlin, but now it is just an old wall that doesn't serve as a boundary. This one is also easy to remember because you can just remember that a relict is old, so a relict boundary is an old boundary. Now a little about how boundaries are created. First comes definition, which is the phase when an exact boundary is decided and agreed upon. Then comes delimitation, when the lines are drawn on maps. In delimitation, they draw the limits on the maps. Next comes demarcation, when the boundary is physically marked with a fence, line, wall, etc. In demarcation, they mark the land. Not all boundaries are demarcated because it is expensive. Lastly comes administration, which is when the government enforces the boundary. Boundaries often lead to conflicts. There are definitional boundary disputes in which countries fight over the language used to define the boundary. There is a location boundary dispute when countries fight over the location of a boundary. There is an operational boundary dispute in which countries fight over the way that a boundary should operate. And there is an allocational boundary dispute when countries fight about how the resources that aren't divided by the border, such as natural gas underneath the soil, are allocated. Pretty self-explanatory, right? There are five state shapes. The first is fragmented. This is when the state exists in several pieces, such as lots of islands. Indonesia, for example, is made up of 16,000 islands. The problems with this shape is that it can be hard to maintain unity between the parts. The second type is elongated. These states are long and thin, such as Chile. This shape can cause transportation problems and can be difficult for a state's capital to maintain influence over the entire length of the state. Just remember that elongated states are long. The third type is compact. This is roughly a circle. The distance from the center doesn't vary too much at any point, such as Switzerland. This shape is usually the political ideal because no one is too far from the center of control. The fourth type of state is prorupt. That is a state that has a piece that protrudes from the core area, such as Thailand, which has a piece that sticks out from the core. This shape has the same problem as elongated states because the protruding piece may not feel the influence of the core. The fifth kind is perforated. This state has a hole punched in the middle of it. South Africa is a perforated state because Lesotho punches a hole in the middle of it. This state shape may have bad relations with the country it surrounds. 
Other than the shapes, there are two types of states, unitary and federal. A unitary state has one central government that holds most of the power. It can have local governments, but they are usually weak. This is ideal for smaller states. On the other hand, a federal state has a central government that shares power with strong regional governments. This is ideal for larger, more diverse states. The United States has a federal government. We have a central government that shares power with local state governments. This is ideal for the U.S. because we are a large, diverse country. State shapes can lead to political enclaves and exclaves. An enclave occurs when a state is completely surrounded by another. For example, since South Africa completely surrounds Lesotho, Lesotho would be an enclave. The opposite would be an exclave which is a piece of the state that is not connected to the rest. For example, Alaska is an exclave of the U.S. because it is not connected to the rest. The first defined political states were city-states. The Greek and Romans used these city-states, which were central cities and the surrounding farmland. Over time, central cities dissolved and bigger political entities were formed. As European city states uh, began building round world empires of the 16th century, they practiced colonialism. In other words, they took control of areas and peoples outside of their state. They used these colonies and lands to extract resources from them and use back home. This process was called mercantilism. Colonization fueled imperialism, which is the process of establishing dominance over a colonized area. Europeans did a lot of this in Africa. Now on to dependency theory. Dependency theory states that many countries are poor today because of European colonization. It says that former European colonies, such as the ones in South America and Africa, are still dependent on their former European colonizers. This is because when Europeans came in, they drew borders according to resources, not cultures, so their boundaries have led to conflict. Also, Europeans did not build a lot of infrastructure to benefit the people, so once European imperialists left, the colonies were left with underdeveloped land and no economy so they are now in debt to their former master because they had to borrow money to build up the infrastructure. The continued economic dependence of these countries is called neocolonialism. Emmanuel Wallerstein was the creator of the World Systems Analysis System and saw that the world was a capitalistic system with interlocking states. This system forms the world into three categories, and they were thought of, thought to shift among these three over time. The three include the core periphery model, consisting of industrialized, developed countries that drive the global economy, uh, semi-peripheral, which are between the economic core and the periphery, and the periphery, which is the underdeveloped countries that had been the core. Now on to geopolitics. Geopolitics defines the way states behave as political and territorial systems. One theory of geopolitics is Frederick Ratzel's organic theory, which compares states to living animals that feed on land and are always wanting to grow larger. Now for a quick recap. Remember that Unit 4 talks about political geography, which has to do with states and nations. States can have many nations within them, and this can lead to conflict within and without a nation. To prevent conflict, people use boundaries, which then in turn form states. Remember that there are five different shape state shapes that are commonly used. Remember the three major models associated with this unit, dependency theory, Wallerstein's theory, which we also know as the core periphery model, and Frederick Ratzel's Hartland Rimland theory. Thanks for watching.